first of all, thank you all for taking the time over your weekends to join us. Um, each of you are focused in one way or another on taking scientific insights in longevity medicine from the lab to the home. And so the initial questions I have is for all of the panelists. Can you each share a couple of the most important things you've integrated into your own lives in an effort to extend your health span and lifespan? So maybe we start with Sophie for that. Sure. Thank you, Chris. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this panel. Um, I think for me, one of the most crucial things to extend my health span and, and uh, therefore my lifespan is to manage my stress. And because I think stress is one of the biggest factor when it comes to aging. And I think when you travel and you go to a uh, place like Switzerland, for example, you know, don't want to brag, but, you know, where people don't have financial stress, they have job security, they have very low pollution, very high food quality, very high, you know, political safety as well. They just look well rested and they just look like they're aging better and they're more healthy. And if you go to a big city where it's very polluted, very stressful, it's really hard to make a living, you need to work much harder to, to barely make it then you do see that people like just they 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 just look more dull somehow and just less healthy and then just tired and and they age faster um so i think a little bit of stress is good but chronic stress is really what's killing you so on a daily basis i really like to just you know take some time to breathe and sit alone it doesn't need to be full on meditation but just to like have some quiet me time uh spend some time in nature of course also invested in a pemf uh, mattress which is amazing it's this pulse electric magnetic shield a uh, thing that also um uh, can really like puts you in a state of deep relaxation i usually fall asleep on it um yeah and i also get like monthly acupuncture so that's a bit more esoteric but for me that's one way to really um make sure i prevent diseases by letting out all the all the stress uh for some people it might also be you know high intensity exercise um, but yeah, I really think stress impacts, you know, everything, your sleep, the way you eat, uh, and the way you age. And then, you know, because I'm a food scientist, the second thing that is the most crucial for me is what kind of food I choose to put in my body, because food is not only the fuel that powers you. It's also what you become in the end, because we use the amino acids from the food. We, of course, we use the glucose as well as a, as a source for energy, but, uh, basically you, be, you are what you eat. Uh, so you need to decide, do I want to become, do I want to be made of, you know, some packaged processed food, high in inflammatory oils, or do I want to be a grass fed organic steak or <laughs> some colorful ve vegetables? Um, I think, you know, it's not so much about, should we be vegan? Should we be vegetarian? Should we eat raw? Should we eat paleo or no carbs? It's more about being a qualitarian um, and yeah, I guess also the Mediterranean diet is, is probably the most balanced and the, and the best when it comes to longevity. Great. Thank you, Sophie. When you were describing a stressful lifestyle or city, I, I felt like you were talking about my hometown, New York City, um, though I am in Florida yeah. now getting some more sun <laughs> and beach. So that's that's nice. Uh, how about you, Rob? Yeah, um, thank you. So I can only agree with Sophie and um, eating clean for me is one of the most important things you can do. And to quote Sophie, actually, um, real food doesn't have ingredients, it is ingredients. And that's, I think, one of the most important things you can um, easily um, integrate in your daily life and also can um, integrate with all of your family. I mean, it's it's um, eating is such a social thing. And if you teach your family, teach your teach people around you, teach your kids to eat healthy, and um, that becomes really a habit for life. And I think that's super important for longevity. Um, for me, the, the second thing is, um, I think we all need to understand our, ourselves better. I see so much in the field of longevity where people just experiment um, with themselves to take different supplements, to try different interventions, but they don't really understand what's happening. And I think um, unless you really create a baseline and understand what's going on in your body, then you can start optimizing for endpoints. But if you don't know your baseline and don't know what's, what's happening throughout these interventions, then you can, um, you, first of all, you cannot know if it's good for you. Um, you can't know if you, it's having the results you expect, if it's um, sometimes maybe not what you would expect. And so that's really something where I recommend everyone, you know, use the, the stuff we have available. We have very cheap tests now available um, for everyone. We have wearable devices that can really measure ourselves with great accuracy. Um, so really 
understand um, to to um, or learn more about your body. That's that's what I would say is really important. Great, thank you, Rob. Uh, how about you, Natasha? Oh, this is a great question, and and I don't want to overstate. I just want to go quickly because we have so many questions. So I'll just say first, um, healthy diet, plenty of exercise, aerobic and anaerobic. I lift weights. I do Pilates, yoga. The whole thing is really important. Um, to know your true biological age uh, through biomarkers and aim for a kind of unbiased attitude in your mind. So meditation and and careful analysis of self-reflection. Second, uh, be a lifelong learner. And I think that's so important to identify longevity facts from clever marketing anti-aging products. And third, understand that currently there is no cure for aging. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. And how about you, Tova? All right. Thank you. Um, as everybody knows, um, I've been a dietitian, but I'm also a nutrition science PhD. So obviously, I believe in the power of nutrient dense foods. Um, I also practice staying hydrated. I don't smoke. I walk fast. I exercise most days of the, of the week, a variety of exercises ranging from uh, jogging to walking to lifting to yoga. Um, I practice these lifestyle habits, and I also try to not eat for a 12-hour window, so after dinner, up until breakfast on most days. And I say most days I do these habits because I also like to take time to let loose and relax with family and friends um, because we all know the um, importance of being able to relax and keep up those social connections for mental health. Great. Thank you guys. All very well considered responses. So each of you has a different nuanced focus on longevity. Uh, Sophie and Tova more on the nutritional side, while Rob is more from the performance and data analytics uh, perspective and Natasha, of course, from transhumanism. So with that in mind, can each of you sum up two or three future new developments in your specific field that you think are very important and or you look forward to? So for that, let's start in reverse order. Let's go back to Tova again. Up oh, after she finishes drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, uh, cool question. Um, I am thoroughly looking forward to science advances in the personalized nutrition space because I work with diverse clients. I also look forward to those technological developments in nutrition and health biomarker data collection and data interpretation. Um, I could go on and on, but I'm also looking forward. Uh, there recently has been an uptick and increase in nutraceutical and other lifestyle evidence-based approach research. And I am really excited. And I think part of this is due to the DSI movement and the collaboration between public, private, and DAO sectors. And I really think that's what's gonna help move the healthy longevity research base forward. I'm also hopeful during my lifetime, um, the time will come where people do not have to fear and suffer through aging from the consequences of chronic diseases like my grandparents, my parents, and most of the um, older adult population that I work with. Oh, and I also wanted to highlight, sorry about that. <laughs> um, and, you know, as many of us know um, in, in this conference, um, social determinants of health um, I'm looking forward to those being combated because we all know that social determinants of health highly impact um, health span in people. Um, and lastly, during this pandemic, um, at least here in the US, I have been really excited to see the growth of home health services. And um, mainly because clients are becoming more in the know of their health with at home labs, things like biosensors. Like, I am just amazed with real-time glucose monitors and apps that track nutrition and physical activity. It helps people become more engaged and more proactive to improve their and their family's health. Great. Thank you, Tova. And Natasha? First, uh, biocompatible nanorobots are currently under development, and I think that will make a major paradigmatic shift for all of us. Second, an important automated prosthetic device going to the next phases in design due to AI, haptics, and BCI brain computer integration. So I think that's really, really important for all of us. And third, a maximized knowledge shift, sweeping 
educational or academic platforms on longevity protocols, learning about longevity. And this ties into, I think, what uh, Rob had said about um, getting the information and learning and knowing your own body. Personalized knowledge is so essential. So as a scholar and a PhD in the area of life expansion, that is my focus. Thank you. Great, great responses, Natasha. Thank you. Um, and how about you, Rob? Well, for me, what I really look forward to is that traditional medicine will get a better understanding of longevity medicine and its applications and also how we, we treat longevity medicine. If I talk to a lot of doctors on a day-to-day -day basis and I can still, still feel every day that there's a lot of resistance to this new field. There's a lot of people don't understand what it's about. There's a lot of people really pushing back like, oh, this is nonsense. Now we've been doing longevity all of our lives as doctors. So there's, there's really a lack of understanding. So I really look forward to um, a wider understanding and a wider implementation of, of the strategies that we're all working on. Um, secondly, I think um, what I really look forward to, and I think what will happen and what needs to happen in the future is um, how we think about health data. Because there's so much great data out there that we currently cannot access because it's, so, it's just so siloed. And if we just change the way we think about health data and, and how it could support us and how it um, could benefit us in, in so many ways, um, I think once once we understand it and once that finds, again, its way into the traditional healthcare system, um, then we're going to make a huge leap forward um, towards longevity. And I think thirdly, um, of course, um, the, the old topic that we can't avoid, uh, luckily, is um, AI. Um, all the advances that AI will bring us in the future, um, deep learning, um, you being able with the help of AI and um, algorithms to really um, pair and combine the different um, tests that we have available, the different, dif different uh, mechanisms we have available. I think once we you know, again, this becomes a part of, of um, the accepted um, medicine and healthcare um, that we can ma make a huge leap forward. Thank you, Rob. And Sophie? Um, so I think um, in the supplement fields, just like Natasha mentioned, I think those like magic pills of the future, which would contain nanobots, I think it's we're not there yet, but it is coming. And I've even talked to a friend who is doing some research at EEH Zurich. So it's it's on the way. Those those nanobots that will be able to repair the human body in situ, like really go where the cancer cells are to, to kill them or just deliver the medicine where it's supposed to go um, or even repair DNA. I mean, we, we don't know everything that it will be able to do, but I think in the next, maybe not in the next three years, but in the next 10, 15 years, that's coming for sure. And more uh, in the near future, I think hyper-personalization for supplements. For now, it's very much... Uh, similar dosages for everyone and you you have companies that start doing those at home tests and then they send you exactly what you need based on your deficiencies um, but we're not there yet when it comes to longevity uh, supplements um, exactly what dosage you need the studies are more on the benefits of NMN for example but not exactly how much NMN uh, you'd need whether you are you know this age or this weight or you have this kind of condition so I think that's coming. And I've recently seen a, a startup that does this at-home test where it's either blood or saliva. And then you have this kind of device and you put the probe inside and it, it sends a signal to a lab. It has different partner labs. And then you get the results on the same day, like in real time. Uh, I don't know exactly how it works. I haven't um, really uh, deep dived into it, but I, I think um, that's going to um, evolve for supplements as well, that we can just test ourselves at home much faster than waiting, you know, the three to five weeks until you get your DNA uh, test results. And then more futuristic is that we would have like a 3D printer with the different ingredients that make sense for us based on our DNA. And you test yourself on that day in that moment, the machine tells you, okay, this is what you need. And it's 3D printing the cocktail of, of ingredients that you need. And I'm sure in the future, this is, this is what's coming. Great, thank you, Sophie. So in the interest of time, I'm going to start by asking just one question to each of you. And if we have enough time, then we can go on to a second question. So uh, it, it seems like a common denominator across all of you is the importance of nutrition. And that is the foundation of our health. And as much as we can look towards the future of what will come out, if you don't have that solid foundation, even in the future, you're probably not going to be in the best place that you can potentially be as if you focus on your nutrition and the quality of it. So the first question is for Tova. So you could say that diets are right up there with religions and politics when it comes to the passion and controversy that they elicit, right? 
So whether it be the paleo diet or keto or vegan or Mediterranean, there's a lot of really big audacious claims out there for what will promote the best health. But as I oftentimes like to highlight, these arguments are not focused on a specific end point. They're kind of open discussions. For example, is the goal really to build muscle or is it to lose weight or is it for a social cause, right? So looking at everything through the perspective of longevity and extending health span and lifespan, with that context, what would you say is the best diet for longevity and why? That's a great question. Chris, and I get asked all the time. And so this obviously in this field continues to be a really big, uh, big debate. However, I am of the mindset and I have been for a long time that we can learn from regions of the world where people have less rates of chronic disease. And collectively, the evidence is pointing towards more plant-based eating patterns with a emphasis on healthier fats. Now you can spam my email. You're not going to hurt my feelings if you disagree with this. Um, but I do want to mention, however, some people have intolerances or allergies to specific plants. Um, I am in general an open-minded type of nutrition professional, professional because I have seen different types of eating patterns work for different people. So I think the best diet for longevity should be tailored to an individual's health goals and preferences. Like um, Chris, you were talking about um, what, what do they want to achieve? Great. Yeah. And I, I can say personally that I've found that I have a sensitivity to nuts. So it, it took me years to figure this out, but I was always wondering why in the middle of the afternoon, I would just feel really tired and have to take a nap. And I felt, um, really fatigued and it turned out that nuts, um, not immediately, but hours later were, was causing that. And there's nuts in so many different products like nutrition bars and keto products and so on. It was everywhere and I wasn't able to identify it. But once I did, my energy levels just restored to normal. So that that's a great point you raised, Toba. Well, and kudos to you, Chris, because it takes some people years to figure that out. So way to track I'm a, Well, I'm not going to say how long it took me, but uh, <laughs> it, it wasn't overnight. I'll tell you that. Uh, okay. So let's, let's move on to uh, maybe like the next step when it comes to longevity. So we have diet and then we can move on to supplements. So this question is for Sophie. Um, so my company Novos, much like Avea also sells NMN and we made a deliberate decision not to go with the ever popular nicotinamide riboside or NR yet. It's still a very common question that we're asked why NMN over NR. And I'm sure you're being asked that question too. So can you share with the audience why you chose to formulate your products using nicotinamide mononucleotide or NMN and not NR? Yes, of course, and um, probably for similar reasons to, to you and to uh, Novos. Um, I don't want to bash NR and, you know, maybe it's working for some people, but um, we decided to go with NMN because when we reviewed the literature, uh, we found more benefits, especially on humans, um, with studies that included NMN and uh, not NR, uh, especially on endurance and physical performance overall. And I feel it on myself that my workouts are just more efficient ever since I, I started taking NMN. Um, and, and I need to mention that there are no human clinical trial for now that really compare NR and NMN in the same study. So it's, it's also difficult to, to exactly know. And I hope that such a trial will be on the way in the near future. Um, then another reason is that NMN is a more direct precursor to NAD than NR. NR first needs to be uh, transformed into NMN. And of course, some people argue that NMN is a bigger molecule, so it cannot go through the cell membrane, uh, which is a myth that has been disproven uh, lately because there are transporters that do transport NMN through the cells, so the cells can absorb NMN. Um, then NMN is also more stable in the bloodstream. Uh, NR tends to degrade into uh, vitamin B3. Um, also, just from my own results, I used to, be, before I, I founded uh, Avea, I used to take an R and I didn't really feel much. I just thought, okay, maybe, you know, I'm just too young. I'm, you know, I'm 33 now. I just thought maybe I need to wait. Maybe it's just like in the long run, it's going to pay off. But when I started NMN, I just really felt a difference in my energy levels and in my sleep quality and in my workouts, just as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and we have regular calls with um, customers and our most loyal customers a lot of them have 
also tried to take NR and one of them took it for a year and said they felt not he, he felt nothing no difference and same thing he switched to NMN and felt immediate result like after two three weeks uh, felt a change so I think you know the, the proof is in the stories um, and then last but not least uh, you, we all know David Sinclair and he's one of the most famous scientists in the field of aging and research on NMN and he takes NMN and is very vocal about it he doesn't even endorse any you know NMN brand but he feels more he feels strongly about NMN so we kind of went with his opinion as well yes all all great great excellent points many of which we considered ourselves as as well um, okay so next is for you Rob so if, if we go from nutrition and supplementation then What's next? It's really to track how you're doing, as you, you mentioned earlier, to see if you're actually having improvements on, on your health. So much like you, I've been on a journey over the past decade to track my biomarkers, many of which are correlated with aging. And I've begun sharing those uh, with the public on a blog I launched a few weeks ago called slowmyage.com. Doing so has forced me to consider the distinction between markers of general health markers of aging and markers of disease, each of which can be somewhat ambiguous in terms of what it is exactly pointing to and how to interpret it. So being an authority in this space, what have you found are some of the best ways to measure longevity first and foremost, and by extension health from biomarkers to tests and, and any other things that you'd like to share? Well, I think you're making a very important distinction there um, when you talk about the tests available, because a lot of tests available that just look at uh, life expectancy. So if you look at um, you know, clinical tests, there are very interesting tests, for example, that um, measure the correlation between life expectancy and gait, so walking, spe uh, walking speed in geriatrical patients. There's a very strong correlation, but that, that we only look at life expectancy. If we talk about longevity, um, we look at, um, first and foremost, also quality of life and the quality of life years that we have. And for that, I don't think there's a single gold standard test out there that we can say, okay, that, that's the one um, that measures everything uh, in, the, in the best way. Um, and, and the field is rapidly evolving. But of course, we have a variety of tests available we can use um you know if we want to differentiate between the chronological age so the the clock that we're, that's ticking for us and the biological age so how our cells behave and and how well or badly they behave um the most common one of course is the horworth clock uh, which was developed in i think 2011 um looking at some epigenetic markers but there's a var variety of other um aging clocks that are very promising and interesting so there's um things like blood biomarkers of course um there's um things like photo aging um clocks where you um use ai and um uh, photographic images and to to um, evaluate that um something that's very surprising to a lot of people is psychological age there's a very strong correlation between how old people self-report they feel um, and how, how old they actually get. There's a very strong correlation in, in studies that have been um, uh, shown that. Um, there's things as physiological, uh, physiological age, and there, of course, um, there's a lot of other aging clocks in development, uh, whether it's a microbiome, um, transcriptome aging clocks and so on so um i don't think there's there's uh one test i can um recommend and again i think what's what's very interesting and what's very important is um look at the tests that are available and um get baselines for yourself and then look at what interventions do for you and i think that's that's one of the things that really can can show um now how things make a difference for you great thank you rob so Natasha, hmm. <laughs> so, uh, so, so you've already mentioned a couple of the technologies that are around the corner uh, in terms of uh, improving health and optimizing health. Um, so you're very much focused on the future and, and I'm particularly excited to speak to you uh, looking towards what might come, right? So if, if you're keeping up with the news, it's always made out to seem like the world is falling apart and we're in our final days. But if you look at the data about things like violence or poverty or health, um, this is clearly not the case. So can you offer a bit more hope and optimism to our viewers along the same theme as uh, uh, the, the prior question you answered? What world would you like to see and believe is possible in the next 10 years from now and in the next 30 to 40 years? Generally speaking, <clears throat> I'd like to see a more humane humanity, I think, um, bar none. That's what we aim for. Why live longer if we're, we lack 
a sense of mindfulness and ethics and own personal moral compass um, and treat each other well. So that's, that's primary. Um, but getting to the question, let's see, 10 years, uh, probably the um, will be beyond the threshold of doubt. Society has shifted and we've accepted aging as a disease. And I think that that is right around the corner, largely because of the trending of information um, across sectors, across um, socioeconomic, political sectors, and the growth of the longevity industry in the trillions of dollars. So at this time in 10 years, aging is considered a medical disease. Uh, neurotransmitters are stored in chemical cryobiology and simulated in artificial um, structures. And that is, again, just like the C. elegans has been, its old connectome has been sequenced and digitally um, simulated, um, more on the digital side than in actuality. But 20 years, life expectancy challenges have accepted limited um, of a limitation of the maximum lifespan and that we don't like it. You know, people say, no, wait, 122.3 approximate years are not long enough. And that's the um, quantifiable uh, maximum lifespan. So interestingly, that I think it is going to go into areas that are a little bit anti-longevity at the moment, like UNESCO, who you'd think would be pro-longevity, um, but it, it's really, really not. So I think that UNESCO and other organizations such as it on a global scale will um, aggregate activism for longevity, who changed its name to who low our World Health Longevity Organization. And political fractions will um, agree on laws to protect the right to longevity. Uh, for example, Davos Conference, which just focused it on longevity, which was a big surprise and a delight, uh, will probably establish an economic trajectory for longevity in the long term. 40 uh, years, 30 to 40 years approximate that age, I would say whole body prosthetics are deployed. And this is largely because of the exquisite design in that field. And as I said before, narrow AI and uh, machine learning will advance. We won't be at super intelligence by that time, but AGI will be starting to lift off. But um, I think that um, people will opt to legally take on multiple identities and coexist in the physical world that we know today, this material um, biosphere, as well as simulated virtual worlds, which are gaining great momentum at the, at the time and take on avatars as having an identity, perhaps a passport or an identity card, et cetera. And, and the earliest form of post-humans will just start. And that is not separating from our homo sapiens sapiens species, but being an augmented human in reality, not just theoretically. Um, and I probably would expect that um, a human brain will be revived from biostasis in pretty good condition. Maybe it's functionality, not fully formed, but at least uh, revived from biostasis. Great. Thank you, Natasha. So we're, we're all familiar with the hallmarks of aging, and some scientists uh, are of the perspective that one in particular uh, has the most potential, that being epigenetic aging. And uh, the epigenome and reprogramming the epigenome in order to be able to restore entire cells uh, and organs, right? The, for example, to reverse blindness. Uh, Natasha, this is a follow-up question for you. Do, do you have a perspective on the promise of the epigenome and how far it can take us? And do you think it will take us all the way to the point of being able to reprogram ourselves back to a younger state across all organ systems or do you think it will be necessary to have some of these other technologies that you're talking about, like nanobots, like um, prosthetics and so on? Um, how, how far do you think we get on the epigenetic side of things? With a, um, a, you know, a long history of research in my um, diverse fields, I really ask this question a lot in when I'm, when I'm you know, reading and, and writing and, and preparing research. I think epigenetics is a brilliant field. I think it's really important. I think it ties into how old we think we are and how our environment can help carve 
um, new ways of being in the world. But I, I think that as long as we're biological, we're going to have to deal with the building structures of biology. And those building structures are the cellular mechanisms. And those cellular mechanisms rely on chemistry and they rely on their own functionality in their separate systems and organs and the central nervous system as they work together. I don't think epigenetics is going to cure aging. I think it's, again, great. I, I, I love the concept. I love it, the approach. I think that takes us out of the, the you know, genetics is over here and epigenetics over here. We're starting to see its importance. But I think that we're still going to need, as long as we're biological animals, that we're still going to need to have another system working with our biological DNA, much like mitochondria, which does not share the human DNA, um, evolved with us. We would not be here today if we did not have mitochondria uh, creating our ATP or energy. Likewise, I don't think we're going to be able to reverse aging, rejuvenate cellular um, uh, uh, mutations and um, eruption or decay without something in there like nanomedicine, tiny robots working with our system. And I think eventually they'll be seen as part of our system. I hope I answered your question. Yes, yes, very, very well. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you. Uh, we've only got a couple of minutes left. Uh, Rob, this is a follow-up question for you. So what, uh, for, for years, we've been able to map our microbiomes, our genomes, and now even our epigenomes, transcriptomes, and proteosomes, and so on. Uh, however, some would argue that we've only begun to understand each of these. And we need to be very careful about making conclusive recommendations based on the results of these tests. Um, what, what would you say this data is currently able to provide us with uh, when it comes to making recommendations and, and how carefully should we proceed? For example, providing nutrition recommendations based on what our genome says or based on our microbiomes. Do you have a, a perspective or an opinion on this? Oh, that, that's a that's a great question. Um, how, how many hours do we have to answer this? Is this uh, <laughs> We've um, got about two minutes before uh, <laughs> listener questions. Yeah. No, I think it's it's uh, starting with the microbiome. It's a very interesting question. Um, definitely, there are tests available that, that can help us um, look at what microbiota, or in a, from a clinical setting, um, we have in our guts. But um, do we really understand um, what they do? I'm not so sure. So there's some interesting studies um, currently looking at the um, different microbiota at different age groups. And what's the, the, the say the, the right composition uh, for one age group might not be the, the right one for another age group, um, or in fact might be actually um, having detrimental effects. So I think we need to better understand um, what's good for, for what specific um, population of people. And um, before we start optimizing um, too deeply, because what can also happen, you can always over optimize, um, especially when we talk about microbiota of any form, um, where you get some good populations up, but also good populations take some space, right? And they might push out other good populations that, that are needed. So um, I think it's important that that's, um, we carefully look at what's, what's really happening in this field. And there will be lots of um, new developments coming up in the next years, which I'm, I'm pretty sure of. Um, if we talk about um, genome testing, um, I mean, the, the the whole genome is huge. If we just look at the um, exome, which is about uh, one percent um, of the whole genome, so uh, we're looking at something like um, uh, thirty billion SNPs, and we probably understand uh, around a thousand um, in a in a meaningful way. So, in a meaningful way, and um, what I'm referring to is that we can um, start to look at them from a perspective of how can we. Um, manipulate that um, or can you how can we manipulate the expression and optimize the expression um, of these genes uh, through lifestyle through nutrition and through anything else and um, especially in the, in the context of pathways and I think there there is some very interesting things we can do right now um, but there's new science coming out um, every day and um, the, the whole field looked completely different 10 years ago the whole field would will look completely different in 10 years. Um, so I think it's always important to, to stay on top of science, um, to look at the literature, to look at um, the studies. And um, if, if you work in fields, um, don't overpromise. Um, I think that's very important because there's there's no magic pill, there's no magic um, nutrition, even if we know um, someone's genes. Um, we can make meaningful interventions. Yes, I believe that. Um, but um, we're still not at a point where we can just um, magically make things appear or disappear as we wish. Great response, Rob. I, I agree on all of those points. So uh, 
I'd like to open the floor to listener questions. If anybody has a question, uh, feel free to share it in chat or Oliver, I'll, I'll ping you uh, if you've received any questions. If you wanna jump in and share those, um, I'll wait a few seconds. And if not, then I'll continue asking questions. Hi, Chris. Yeah, um, let me just take a look. I've got a stream coming in on my uh, Discord. Um, don't see any questions yet. Um, or maybe it's way up in my stream. So if anybody listening in on my Discord can send me questions, uh, I appreciate it. Otherwise, um, oh, right oh, here. There's one. there it is. Um, it's true uh, that there aren't any comparative human studies on uh, NR versus m and but there are trials on each of them individually, both increase circulating NAD+. Plus. Uh, but the health effects seem to be the square what <laughs> square root of zero. Is that a question or is that a statement <laughs> from Jake? <laughs> That's a statement. Um, <laughs> it's a, yeah. <laughs> uh, you can answer it anyway. <laughs> you can answer it. I can also answer it if you want. I mean, we get that from from people on our social media channels as well. You know, people who think they've seen all the studies yeah. or know how to read a. a a scientific study but actually if you really i mean you could even just go on nmn.com and see all the studies there are listed either on animals or on humans and there are new human studies coming out like almost every month at the moment and the the, the major one came out in the last two years and it's simply not true um nad precursors have shown benefits like i said on on um muscle performance on um sleep quality uh, on stress reduction, on um, uh, menopause, postmenopausal uh, women, on um, insulin sensitivity, uh, on 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 really various uh, kind even of viruses, uh, even viral yeah, replication. Yeah, I don't want to. What's the big one on claims, but COVID <laughs> because viruses they use up your NAD um, storage in order to. I mean, your immune system is is using it in order to heal. So if you replenish it. So I think there was a comment to the question. I think the questioner was just being snarky and <laughs> that NR and MN don't work at all. Well, maybe it doesn't work for you. Maybe your NAD levels are optimal and just amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, that's all I have to say. I don't know. I mean, Chris, you can add some stuff if you want, but uh, we get that a lot. It's okay. We believe in, in, in our NAD programs. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, th I think that was a great response. I, I personally have taken NMN for, for years and have, have noticed um, a, a difference. You know, wh when you talk about placebo effects, uh, placebo effects tend to last for a few weeks or months, but uh, not, not over the course of years. And so um, that combined with the research being done by many, many labs, not just Dr. David Sinclair, though he is the most famous uh, working with it, there's a lot of convincing evidence, as as you mentioned, Sophie. So, um, yeah, and there the are some people, one thing, but but really, the customers who come back and tell their stories and 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 just tell us about all the positive effects and how the supplements are changing their lives. That's what the, the, right. And, and Sophie, I'm sure you're familiar with this. There are some people out there who believe that supplements are creating expensive urine, and there's no value to them whatsoever, <laughs> uh, regardless of what the science shows, what the evidence shows. Um, I, I have, uh, for example, on slowmyage.com, I, I share how I've reversed my epigenetic age by more than one third of my chronological age. That's not something that is coming simply from exercising and eating healthy and sleeping well, uh, because there are millions of people doing that. What are the different distinct things that I'm doing? It's the supplements that, that, uh, we're creating at Novos that I'm taking, including the NMN. So. Um, you know, I'm kind of like an N equals one case study, and I'm not trying to say that, uh, you know, my anecdotes are, are definitive evidence, and we, we do need to prove this out with science. But there is a lot of science that we have based our formulations on, more than 190 studies, and um, in humans and animals and so on. And then even what I'm seeing in myself is, is proof positive that it's more than just creating expensive urine. Yeah, and uh, just, just for me to just, sorry to jump in, I, I mean, you could just jump on PubMed and <laughs> can confirm that. Uh, so, I mean, supplements, um, yeah, somebody's some somebody's uh, uh, NADH levels could be already optimized. Somebody's metabolism could be optimized. So clearly that's, you know, you might already maximize the benefits for yourself. But but yeah, I mean, the health effects seem to be pretty, um, uh, pretty well documented just to, 
a cursory PubMed search. If I may add to I'm that, I'm at risk of um, the, st the studies in this area because I'm not, I'm not trying to be a skeptic, but I am not yet convinced because there are other ways to increase NAD. And I do think we need to keep in mind too, for any of us who work with people who have cancer or who have had cancer, we need to be mindful of their holistically what they're eating and if they are over supplementing. Because a lot of people, consumers have the mindset that more is better or more is better than what's on the label. So I do think it's important that companies are giving true guidance to people and to make it clear if the this, this studies have been done in humans or if it's only been done in human cells in animals, because as we know, human cell studies and animal studies don't always translate to what happens in humans. Yeah, Tova, you, you make a great point in particular about cancer. And, and one way to position that is that uh, cancerous cells are, are greedy, hungry cells. And so the, the things that like are good, <laughs> exactly, the things that are good for us when we're in a healthy fit state are actually really good for the cancer cells to be able to, to proliferate as well. So um, that's to say that if, if, if you know you don't or believe you don't have cancer, you don't have reason to believe you do have cancer, then you should be getting all of the nutrition because it will then reduce the likelihood that you do one day get the cancer. But if you've already had cancer recently or you have it, then you need to work very closely with your doctor. For example, B vitamins can accelerate the growth of tumors. Uh, whereas they could also prevent the creation of the tumor in the first place. So it's it's a little bit gray when it comes to somebody who does have cancer and you have to be very careful, yes. Absolutely, and, and it depends on the type of the cancer too. I entirely agree. Mm -hmm. yeah, if I may, I may add something to that at risk of uh, beating a dead uh, horse. Um, Again, it's often a question of, of you know testing levels. I mean, it's it's um, if you don't know what baseline someone has, um, yes, it may, may not have the same effect as for someone else because that person might might have a completely different baseline. And I've seen this so many times um, with you know a, a very simple uh, example being uh, vitamin D three. Of course, most people um, ha are do not have sufficient levels of vitamin D three. So. Um, Supplementing vitamin D3 might have a good effect, but I've seen people that that pretty much live in their basement, never see the daylight, um, and if you look at their serum levels, they're they're above the range. And so, so if that, you know, will the same amount of vitamin D3 have the same effects on that person as for someone who is deficient? No, it will not. Of course not. But that's why it's so important to understand the baselines and 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 test and test before and after, and and that's also something that not all studies do very well. Um, because they often don't look at the baselines um, before and after and just look at the effects of, of taking whatever it is, whether it's NMN or something else. Yeah. Right. And, and Rob, that, that's a great point you, you raise about studies. Uh, typically, studies are looking at what happened to the population of the study and is there a significantly significant change across the population. But you oftentimes also find these outliers within studies where somebody may have responded miraculously well to an intervention and they're kind of just group together uh, with with everybody else. So that I think just echoes the importance of looking at yourself and using data to quantify and see how you are responding to a specific intervention because you might respond quite differently than other people in the general population. So uh, Oliver has a question. So uh, and I, I think we'll end with this. So Oliver, if you'd like okay. to jump in. Oh, okay. Well, we um, all right. So we're. We, we are extended a little bit, so we have some time, but um, I, have a, I have a rather different question because I know, you know, we're always thinking about supplements and adding in good things back in, into ourselves, kind of augmenting what we're, we're lacking and, and building up levels of positive metabolites to get the system optimized. Um, but you're all heavily involved in nutrition. So I have, I have the opposite question. What role do negative um, constituents have in our diet, such as heavy metals, for example, and, and other toxins that, you know, I mean, we're, we're hearing it. There's a lot of, there's a lot of plastic pollutants out there, very complex, you know, hydrocarbons in our environment, heavy metals, of course, you know, in our, in our diet from mercury to, you know, to arsenic, um, you know, uh, which is used in pesticides. And, uh, you know, have you given, given some thought about, about, you know, that having an effect on, on, on our, uh, you know, on our metabolism. And if you've considered, you know, ways to remediate that and, and uh, yeah, I just like to hear your viewpoint on that. Cause I, uh, I haven't heard much spoken about that part of the equation. 
Natasha, please. <laughs> okay, yes. Uh, people are so concerned with global warming and environmental issues and not concerned about their own well-being. It's almost like it's too selfish to be concerned about your own health while the, the earth is suffering. But unless we take care of ourselves first, we can't help anyone else, especially our lovely planet. So in thinking about the pollutants in the environment, uh, there is great risk with environmental uh, pollutants. I got bladder cancer. And the reason I'm saying this is because from toxins in my environment where I was working and I was at stage three, so I had cancer for a couple of years before I even knew it, and the doctors didn't know what caused it, but I did my research because I'm a scientist, and I discovered it was the textiles I was working with uh, in one of my businesses that caused it. Now, bladder cancer has a high rate of return, so you want to make sure that, you know, when you have bladder cancer, you don't, I don't cook with aluminum period, the end. I had aluminum poisoning at the same time. Um, I'm very careful about where I go and what I do. I also have skin cancer, so I stay out of the radiation of the suns as much as possible. And there are several different types of skin cancer, basal cell carcinoma, um, squamos, and melanoma. Squamos um, can spread and you can lose your, your limb. Um, it won't metastasize, but melanoma will, and the rates are going up. So any um, scientific research on that shows that we need to be very careful. The, um, the, the plastics, there's concerns about overusing plastics in our food, not to use them in the microwave. I think all these cautions are very important. Some may deal a little bit with hyperbole uh, when you go too far in the direction of the environmentalist uh, dogma. But I think that we're all environmentalists because if we're into longevity, we will have to live in a healthy environment. Um, the toxins are very concerning, and I think that the reports on what's in the water are essential. You must have clean water, so having a purifier for your water in your home, no matter where you live, I think is extremely important. And to cook with the, the, the um, utensils that don't emit certain um, chemicals like aluminum or um, other uh, deterrents, and to be careful about where you're working and what you're working with, because they are invisible uh, toxins around us. Clothing as well, uh, wearing pure cotton is better than wearing synthetics. Sleeping on cotton sheets is better than sleeping on sheets that have been treated with certain chemicals to lie flat. <laughs> it's better to have crumbled sheets than flat sheets that have a toxin in them. So all around us, I think it's really important for longevity enthusiasts and practitioners to pay attention to what we're using, how we're using it, and what can be um, emitted from these um, different um, products and variables. Can I jump in real quick? Yeah, go, please. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I really like that you, you touched on water because I can't tell you how many people I work with. And um, I worked, um, one of my first dietitian jobs, I worked at WIC and nearly every child and baby's um, finger that we uh, pricked um, had low hemoglobin. And, um, you know, it's a lot of places still have lead-based pipes and most people will not run their water for three to five minutes because they're concerned about their water bill. And frankly, they don't have the time <laughs> to do that all the time. Um, so I, I definitely am happy to see the movement of more affordable housing um, water filtration systems right at the top. Um, but a lot of consumers are, and people are not informed if they hear from authorities that the water that they drink is safe, they assume that it's safe coming out of the, the, um, the faucet. Uh, we also have the problems in certain of the areas of the US, especially, um, with um, in, in um, water, certain um, um, nitrate levels rising. And so <laughs> I was really surprised when I was in Iowa for graduate school, um, a legitimate blue baby syndrome problem in babies because of the high nitrates in the water <laughs> um, binds hemoglobin. Um, also thyroid, I was shocked when I worked in long-term care, nearly every single uh, older adult I worked with had uh, hypothyroid. Uh, we know that uh, heavy metals, especially lead, uh, binds um, thyroid tissue. Um, also, uh, okay, I, consumers, I, I always encourage them to be picky about their supplements. And I am so happy to see good supplement companies ensuring the quality and purity of their uh, supplements. Because for instance, whenever we isolate something from an animal, for instance, whey protein, it's concentrated. 
And if that animal was eating grass from mm -hmm. soil that was high in the heavy metals uh, or, or uh, the, get the collagen from that animal and you're heavily consuming it, um, that's not leaving your body. Um, so uh, fortunately, these, these um, you, uh, companies that are transparent, that they're sending their, their uh, product out for third party testing, they're doing their research with the university or CRO, they're getting these certifications to show to prove the quality of their product. Um, they'll make it very transparent on their website call um, and, and you can uh, get that information. And they also, whenever they switch vendors for ingredients, mm -hmm. they will provi provide updated information on that. But uh, great question, whoever asked. I, uh, Natasha, I think we could talk hours about that. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll throw a very quick one in there as well. Uh, so there was a study, I believe, published just a few months ago, um, undertaken by the Energy Policy Institute at the University of Chicago. And this looked at air pollution and found that there was a slightly greater impact on death from air pollution than smoking. There was three times more uh, significant impact on death uh, than alcohol use and than unsafe water to the topic of water. Um, and six times more deadly than HIV and AIDS. So uh, the air that we breathe, uh, if you're in a, in a congested uh, metro area versus somewhere with, with fresh air, um, and then also consider air filtration in your home if you do live in a big city where there's a lot of uh, pollution. There's, uh, of course, the, the typical um, air filters and HEPA filters. There's also something I just recently got um, in my, my home. I have an HVAC system and uh, you can actually get one that um, integrates into the HVAC system. So all of the air that is being circulated throughout the home um, can also be um, treated with UV light, with uh, reducing dust and mold and so on. So there's a, a w number of ways that you can clean the air that you're breathing in. Chris, I think um, uh, we, we need to perhaps wrap up um, about a minute or so. Um, maybe even now, <laughs> I've just been uh, pinged by Christy, but that's, that's it's interesting that you mentioned. I just want to interject one 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 statement about the this, the air pollution versus the smoking. I always thought it very bizarre that hospitals in New York City have a sign that says outside, please no smoking, yet there's like 500 taxi cabs idling right outside. And I'm like, one guy with a cigarette versus like all those cabs belching out, you know, or, or trucks with diesel pollutants coming out is, is just a kind of a disconnect, right? With, with, you know, with reality a little bit. So, but yeah, really, um, really uh, something to think about. So anyway. And you guys should all move to Switzerland. I think that's- Oh yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> Maybe I'll just... stay with you until we find housing. <laughs> <laughs> I was in, in Geneva and Lausanne uh, for the first time a, a few months ago, and it is a very, very beautiful country. Um, all right. So since we are up on time, uh, I, I want to thank all of our guests. Thank you, Sophie and Rob, Tova and Natasha for joining. This was a very interesting dis uh, discussion, a, a lot to learn and a lot that we shared with the community. So thank you for contributing. Thank you. Thank you.